This video will be part two of chapter three on bioenergetics in our exercise physiology text. So far we've been talking about different types of chemical reactions that are subgroups of cellular metabolism, uh, such as exergonic reactions and endergonic reactions, oxidation reactions and um, reduction reactions. <clears throat> All of those reactions in the cells in our bodies are catalyzed by enzymes, proteins that act as catalysts. So what are they doing? They're increasing the number of reactions occurring in a given amount of time once the products are available and the, and the enzyme is turned on. They just increase the, the reaction rate. <clears throat> How do they do that? Well, it turns out that in order to start a reaction, you have to invest some energy, a little bump of energy, to get the reactants to combine or to split or whatever it is that's happening in the chemical reaction. The activation energy. A lot of the reactions that we'll be looking at would be utterly impractical if they were just uh, represented um, the reactants, the starting materials placed in water, but in the presence of an enzyme will reduce the activation energy. I don't know if this cartoon is very sort of convincing. Maybe they should have drawn this little red fence a lot lower than that. The point is the reaction can readily proceed and that's the job of the enzyme to make it actually work at a pure, appreciable degree. Without the enzyme, no go. <clears throat> There's a clinical value in studying the enzymes in the blood. This is a little clinical aside. Um, the cells in your body have many enzymes they, they have in common, but there are also usually some cell type specific enzymes. And there are certain diseases that involve the, the damage and destruction of cells of a particular organ, say the heart in the case of a heart attack, or the liver in the case of a liver infection with, with a hepatitis virus or other form of inflammation. Um, so Looking in the blood with specific detection tools that can distinguish cell-specific enzymes can give us a hint about the health of organs in the body. The, the, the presence of the enzymes serve as biomarkers for tissue damage. So, for example, the heart cells produce a heart cell-specific lactate dehydrogenase. And that specific form can be identified, and if we see a lot of that in the blood, we can infer there's been a heart attack, a myocardial infarction. Sometimes we don't know. Someone comes in with chest pain, we're not sure what in the world's going on. It's one way to kind of confirm that there is, in fact, some heart injury. Creatine kinase also is released into the blood during heart attacks or after heart attacks. Muscular dystrophy is a destructive, degenerative disease of skeletal muscle cells, so a lot of cells are being destroyed and a lot of creatine kinase would then be found in the blood. Certain types of alkaline phosphatase may be found in the blood uh, during in the conditions of bone cancer or other unusual bone problems. Paget's disease is a, is a disease in which there's very rapid rate of bone synthesis, but not healthy bone, uh, but in, in, in the same time there's going to be uh, alkaline phosphatase released into the blood. So anyway, you get the idea. So we can use uh, our knowledge, our molecular biology knowledge about, about um, enzymes and how to identify them um, to uh, diagnose disease. <clears throat> the enzyme, each enzyme catalyzes one specific chemical reaction. So the enzyme is going to bind to some, some reactants or substrates, they're often called, and then chemically modify them. In this case, we see a, a reaction in which two uh, reactants are being combined to form one product molecule. Sometimes react, a reactant may be broken down to form multiple uh, breakdown products and so forth. All kinds of reactions are possible. Um, but the point is, every enzyme has a very precise shape and the enzyme activity depends on that shape or the substrate will not interact with the enzyme. There are some conditions, some challenging conditions of, of muscle cells or of cells in your body in which the enzymes may begin to change shape and the enzyme activity may be compromised. 
uh, temperature is warm. Um, interestingly, uh, there's a range over which rising temperature simply serves to increase enzyme activity because everything molecularly is happening a little faster at higher temperatures. Things are moving more quickly, uh, changes in position and so forth happen more quickly, enzymatic catalysis happens more quickly. However, once we reach a certain point, then we have a drop in enzyme activity, a fairly precipitous drop because of denaturation, it's called a loss of the shape of the proper shape of the enzyme and it can't do its job. pH. Um, during exercise, I'm sure you're familiar with the notion that um, during a high intensity exercise, some lactic acid may be produced and there's some chronic correlation between the presence of lactic acid or the accumulation of lactic acid and fatigue. And one of the things that is behind that is the pH change causing a denaturation or change in shape of enzymes and you know, loss in enzyme efficiency, loss of enzyme activity. Here's just a graphical representation of those two principles. Here we see increase in temperature on the x-axis and the rate of enzyme activity uh, on the, the y-axis. So here, this little space between the dotted lines represents uh, the range of possibilities of body temperature in normal people uh, at rest and during exercise. And so as you can see, as we begin to exercise at a higher and higher rate, the, the steady state body temperature will rise, and, and for a while, <coughs> excuse me, that will cause an increase in enzyme activity, increase in energy production, increase in, uh, in contraction of uh, velocity and so forth, contraction ability of muscle cells. But if we continue, if the body temperature continues to rise, say it's too hot out, it's too humid, and we're exercising at too high a rate for those conditions, we're going to write, we're going to have hyperthermia which is a very dangerous thing indeed. So you see this, this blue line dropping, the enzymes are no longer working. You think, oh, well, then the muscles can't contract. But unfortunately, everything happening in all your cells is enzyme dependent, as we just mentioned. And so all your neurons, for example, in your brain will no longer be able to function, no longer be able to control normal uh, body functions, and, and it it's can be lethal. Um, pH, we can see also there's a narrow range of pH uh, that your body fluids can um, can actually represent or, or um, can occur in your body fluids, and, and that's the sweet spot for enzyme activity, and it's not an accident. If, if, we, if we were to raise the pH higher, um, the more alkaline enzymes would stop working. If we made things more acidic, uh, for example, with lactic acid production inside of a muscle cell cytoplasm, very quickly the enzymes in the muscle cell uh, stop working. So what are our fuels? the source of energy for all of our cellular functions. Um, glucose is one of the two major fuels for all of our energy needs in our cells. So carbohydrates uh, are the class of macro uh, biological molecules that include glucose, a simple sugar. Um, we take in glucose into our body, oftentimes in the form of starch, a carbohydrate, a complex carbohydrate that comes from plants. That's the stored form of glucose in plants large polymers of glucose, and <clears throat> that goes then into the blood and is taken up by cells. The glucose goes into the blood after digestion, and the cells can oxidize it and form energy. So, glycogen is the storage form of glucose in our cells, mammalian, mus uh, mammalian cells, and in our liver and muscle cells, we will take glucose up from the blood uh, at, during times of plenty and assemble it again into large polymers, tree-like structures of glucose to use later. <clears throat> Glycogenolysis is the process of getting those glucose molecules back. So after a meal, we store glucose in the form of glycogen, right? That's what we hope to do. We exercise, and then we hope to go out and eat a nice uh, high content of a carbohydrate meal, and we'll store a lot of glucose as glycogen. And then when we're exercising later, glycogenolysis will take place. We'll break down the glycogen and release the glucose back out into the blood or into the muscle cell cytoplasm for uh, to power muscle contraction, make ATP. The other major fuel for exercise is fatty acids. So fatty acids can be oxidized, like glucose, through a lot of energy. In fact, there's more energy uh, um, potential stored in fatty acids than in glucose, and uh, <clears throat> but glucose is stored in our bodies in the form of fat. And here's a chemical representation of fat. I think it's instructive to see that because you'll know why we keep talking about 
fatty acids versus fat, and glycerol, where does that come from? So here's the form in which we consume fat in our diet, whether from plants or animals. It's a glycerol molecule, which is these three carbons, plus the oxygen you see right there. If it was just a glycerol, it would be OH, OH, OH. And then we have to fasten onto there a fatty acid chain, which if it was broken apart, would just be these two oxygens with a hydrogen there. And we call that a carboxylic acid. So fatty acids uh, are, are attached onto glycerol to form a triglyceride. That's what we have here. That's a fat. And then when we, in digestion, we break off all these fatty acids and free them. And that's how they're absorbed into the body along with, with free glycerol. And then we assemble them back into fat and store them in our adipose tissue and in our muscle cells. So that's the storage form of fat. The, the, the energy production form is fatty acids, the individual chains that you see there, these long carbon chains. <clears throat> there are some other lipids that are prevalent in our body, but they're not, they're not sources of energy. Phospholipids are the, the little molecules that are much like a triglyceride or like a diglyceride. That are, that are the, the, the makeup of the cell membrane, phospholipid bilayer, as it's sometimes called. <clears throat> They're not used as an energy source. Steroids are heterocyclic um, or multicyclic um, carbon ring structures, um, one of which is cholesterol, which is an important component of this, the membrane of all your cells in your body, and steroid hormones, which are derived from cholesterol, some, some minor chemical modis, modifications, give rise to steroid hormones. And those are some really important hormones for controlling blood volume and blood pressure, and of course, maintaining our secondary sex characteristics, our muscle mass, our bone density, the so-called sex hormones, uh, testosterone and estrogen, as well as progesterones. So these are not energy sources either, but I just thought we'd just mention those other lipid sources. And finally, proteins. Proteins are enormously important. We eat them in our diet, and they are long chains of amino acids. We digest them down to amino acids, absorb them into our blood, and the cells of your body can take them up and use them for building proteins of their own uh, need. Um, <clears throat> there, sometimes during prolonged exercise, amino acids can be broken down uh, in your liver cells, particularly into a form that can uh, into glucose, or they can bro be broken down into a form that can enter into the Krebs cycle, which is, as we'll see later, a uh, an energy part of the energy producing machinery and can produce energy, but in general, amino acids are, are for uh, structural use for making proteins. Gluconeogenesis is the process by which the liver produces new protein from non carbohydrate sources during fasting or during exercise. So, that, so some amino acids may get sucked into that process, but by and large, the energy that we utilize during muscle contraction comes from glucose and fatty acids. The way we store the energy that we derive from glucose and fatty acids is in a form of high energy phosphates, they're called. Adenosine triphosphate is a, is a molecule that has a string of three phosphates attached to it. And one of those phosphate phosphate bonds uh, is called a high energy bond in that if we break off that terminal phosphate, a large amount of energy is released. We have to put in a large amount of energy to produce it and then that's how we can store it, and then a large amount of energy is released. And then alternatively, you probably knew about that, but creatine phosphate is another high-energy phosphate molecule that can be used to, to produce, reproduce ATP once it's been converted to ADP by some cellular function, such as energy contract or muscle contraction, I'm sorry. Muscle cells store a lot of creatine phosphate for very quick uh, replacement of ATP during initial muscle contractions. So that's called creatine phosphate or phosphocreatine. Creatine is the non-phosphate bound form. And so you've probably heard of this, the um, dietary supplement creatine. You can go to the, to the um, supplements aisle in Wegmans and find creatine there. And it's a very popular um, uh, substance to consume by people who are interested in bodybuilding and exercise and so forth in the hopes that eating creatine in your diet induce the muscle cells to produce more creatine phosphate, that energy storage form, uh, and to have on the ready for your exercise activities. <clears throat> ATP, when it's been used, 
we find it in the form of ADP, adenosine diphosphate. It's that terminal phosphate that has all the energy. So when we're, as we'll see later, we'll talk more in more detail about producing energy. We take ADP by some magical processes, attach another phosphate, an inorganic phosphate onto it, and now we have ATP. Uh, then when we utilize ATP for cellular processes, we break off that terminal phosphate again and by, the, by way of an enzyme. Remember, all chemical reactions in the cell are enzyme catalyzed. So an ATPase is an enzyme that breaks down ATP into ADP, an inorganic phosphate, and liberating that large amount of energy, which can then be harnessed for cellular activities. Incidentally, this is a chemical uh, structure of ATP. We won't worry too much about, about that, but it's just kind of cool to see it. And here you can see those three phosphates, this terminal phosphate bond right here is with the high energy uh, containing bond that we can just keep on breaking off and replacing that last phosphate on them. Um, so, <clears throat> using the gear analogy one last time, um, <clears throat> forming ATP is the ultimate goal of oxidizing all the fuel molecules, glucose and fatty acids. This is why we need to consume them in our diets in large amounts. And so here we can see uh, you can see the the coupled reactions, exergonic uh, um, catabolism and endergonic anabolism. In this case, making ATP from ADP and inorganic phosphate. So we get a whole bunch of ATP stored, and then we use the ATP and let that be broken down, releasing energy. Exergonic reactions to drive virtually every single cellular process, from muscle contraction to protein synthesis to transport and so forth. So. That's our story. In the next section, we'll talk more about bioenergetics. We'll talk more about the specific chemical pathways by which we actually are going to drive that ATP from glucose and fatty acids.